today I got the one and only, the great <laughs> Mr. Stanley Cooper in the building. World hello, class, hello, good evening. World class guitarist, amazing guy. And real quick, I'm going to say a couple of the amazing artists that he's worked with, he's featured on their records. I mean, I'm looking at Take Six here, Stevie Wonder. I mean, the, the, the list. The list goes on and on and on and on uh, of the credits that this gentleman has. And I just want to say it's awesome that you actually have a list like that. <laughs> and he whipped it out in like five seconds. Like, oh, I, I sent you like a couple of artists that I worked with. And I was like, geez. <laughs> so that's, that that's great, good. man. You are yeah. a legend. You're in the building. Thank you so much for coming through. Uh, thanks for the invite. I appreciate it. So how have you been, right? The, the, the show today is prepare yourself. And of course we're talking about musically, but first tell the folks a little bit about you, your, your philosophy when it comes to music and guitar. Give us a little overview of who Stanley Cooper is. Ah, <laughs> well, my philosophy is simple. Learn the music. <laughs> there you go. Know the parts. Um, and that's being prepared. That's being prepared, yeah. That's being prepared. Being prepared. Yeah. And so you're kind of like a musical prepper, except instead of a bunch of rifles and stacks of <laughs> non-perishable food items, you have hundreds and hundreds of charts that you've accumulated of songs that you have to play on gigs, and then you get you get called the same song 20 years later, and you're like, oh, I already got the chart ready to go. Exactly. There and you so go. you're ready for any situation. You have probably every piece of recorded <laughs> music of all time in, the, in that little device. Work smart, not hard. Yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> and I'm like that, too. Uh, anybody that's worked with me in a band-type situation has uh, seen that I always come with some kind of chart. I'm ready to go for the songs. I'm not one of these by ear guys, right? You sit there and listen to the song 40, 50, 60 times. And it's like, how does that really make it like stick? You know, three days later, you're like, what, what was the key of that song again? Exactly. Exactly. Actually writing out the charts actually helps me to internalize the music. Yeah. I like, agree. A lot of times once I write the chart, I don't need it anymore. Yeah. So it's uh. Which That's is kind of ironic, of right? Yeah. But just it's true though, and and yeah. they've proved that with scientific studies. Just by putting it on paper, mm -hmm. it commits it to memory. So, but tell the folks before we get into it here a little bit more about some of the other guys that you've worked with. So you you had a song featured on uh, the same album as Stevie Wonder, mm -hmm. which is incredible. Uh, I already mentioned Take Six, but you've done a lot of like DMV type stuff. You've sure. done stuff with Trouble Funk. Yes. And so I, I met Big Tony once. And mm -hmm. let me ask you this. Did you see the Go-Go documentary? The, uh, one, Which one? I forget. <laughs> they, well, they, they, they knew, there was a new one that came out. It was, yeah. I think it was TV One or something. It was called The Beat Don't Stop. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that one was yeah, relatively that. recent mm -hmm. uh, and had got a bunch of guys like Big Tony in it. Yes. So what, what's your opinion on Go-Go music and the DMV? Oh, I love go-go music. That's where I started. I started uh, my first go-go uh, band was the Prophecy Band and Show. We were actually based in the uh, Oxon Hill area just outside of D.C., so we were in the suburbs. A Merlin Band is yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's, we would know. That's go-go territory. So, uh, yeah, I worked with them. Uh, I worked with uh, Little Benny, Little Benny and the Masters, and uh, Proper Utensils with James Funk, so who's uh, one of the... Uh, icons and go go you know the prototype for a lead talker i've uh worked with the backyard band and recorded with them a lot of different artists i actually got to record with chuck brown once too oh man yeah we did a uh a gospel record actually so i played all the rhythm guitar and he really? sang and played lead guitar so it was real cool that's interesting yeah. yeah well i mean chuck brown is already an incredible guitarist himself yes. and then yes. you're the guy that he calls <laughs> to <laughs> well, play <wish>. rhythm right <laughs> well we wound up on the same recording in this instance let's just put it that way gotcha gotcha okay all, <laughs> all right. right all right well he but he was okay with it he oh, wasn't like definitely. get this most guy definitely. out of here right, right? oh most definitely so but yeah. but that's awesome he man. gave me a lot of a lot of positive reinforcement a lot of encouragement you know well, again, I, I love you playing my chords with all them fingers. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> right. So, 
That's awesome. He's a great guy. Great guy. Well, I, 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 just, so much. I just appreciate you being here, man, because with the, everything being locked down, it's, it's hard to get musicians to actually come in and uh, come in person. Yes. And it's, it's always more fun. You know, you get the sure. human connection, you get the feed off of people. Exactly. And stuff. Exactly. And that's, that's just a huge thing. I'm sure you guys watching out there, uh, by the way, if, if, you enjoy this conversation and you want to see more legends like Stan, definitely leave a comment. Please. Uh, in the comment section down below, if you got any questions for Stan, you know, oh, how was uh, Chuck Brown's uh, breath? Oh, did <laughs> did Stevie Wonder uh, wear just We didn't his... work that closely. <laughs> <laughs> but, yes, leave some comments in the comment section if you got any questions for the, the living legend, uh, mm. Mr. Cooper, over here. So, But but thank you for coming in here, man. I, I You're one of the first really big uh, guys who is connected oh, to come in here hopefully not the last and um yeah I, it's it's just an honor but uh so let's now get into your philosophy when it comes to music theory okay and how important is that because like i said you come into the rehearsal you have your charts ready to go mm -hmm. there's not a lot of guys who are like that mm -hmm. they say oh put the track on let me listen to it another 40 or 50 right. times during the rehearsal, which makes everything come to a screeching halt. Yeah. So give me some of that kind of stuff. And, and where where did you learn stuff like that? Uh, just being in the trenches with different artists. Um, and, you know, when it comes to rehearsals, rehearsals is for putting the arrangements together and rehearsing the music. You learn the music at home. You learn the music on your own time. Then when you come into rehearsals, it's time to put the show together. Yeah. So just from seeing other folks being chastised for not knowing the mm. music you know, i was like i'm not going to be that guy yeah you know so well like because i think you you mentioned you started out playing a lot of go-go and stuff I did. and it it doesn't seem to not to knock go-go it, it's mm -hmm. a different type of guitar playing right, right. it doesn't seem to yeah. be very music theory intensive it seems to be a lot of percussion type stuff so mm -hmm. how did you go from that to uh, learning how to like take a chart and figure out, okay, that's an A minor seven flat five, and then this is an A flat seven sharp nine. Like, mm -hmm. what what made you want to take on that task of just learning all of the jazz chords? How did you get there? Sure. In the earlier days of go go, I'm an old school go go head. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, we played in go go bands, but the bands that we looked up to were Earth, Wind, and Fire, the Cameos. Uh, the Ohio players, and then we looked up to a lot of jazz artists too. So while we were playing go-go music, we were also playing R&B music, jazz music. Back in those days, it was called pop jazz. There was no smooth jazz; it was pop jazz. Yeah, and I love urban that contemporary, genre. <laughs> which morphed into smooth jazz. So while we were trying to uh, learn music, uh, we listened to a lot of rock. Any, I mean, you know, pretty much any and everything, and we incorporated it, a lot of that into go-go. So even though we were playing go-go, which has maybe a certain approach, uh, just speaking for guitar specifically, like you mentioned, the percussive aspect, the chucking, that type of thing. Um, I was also listening to other music and then incorporating what I learned in these other genres into go-go music. And then, of course, you know, coming behind Chuck Brown, you know, who's a godfather of go-go, phenomenal, phenomenal jazz guitarist. Oh, yeah, and he was and, known for uh, taking very, very jazz musical. standards yes. and putting go-go beats on and all kind of stuff like exactly. that. Exactly, exactly. So, but how yeah. did the other band members feel about you coming in like, oh, guys, we should do a vamp here and do, mm -hmm. like, a polychord and then a thing there? Like, was everybody else mm -hmm. on that level, or did you have to kind of lead the way, or, or were you taught by somebody who was more advanced than yourself? I mean... I learned from everybody, and then, uh, you know, I kind of rubbed a few keyboard players. <laughs> mm -hmm. No offense, Owen. Right. <laughs> you know, nah, you're not voicing that chord correctly. Or this. Oh, I mean, you know, that type of thing. But we all learned from each other, and we were all trying to grow by listening to some of the same material, that type of thing. I remember growing up, other guitarists in the neighborhood, you know, you'd want to be the first guy to learn the new hot solo for the new song that dropped this week, you know. Yeah. So it was that type of thing. And uh, we incorporated all of that into into the music that we were playing. 
That's awesome. But they were receptive to it. Oh, yeah, right? most they, definitely. They everybody was like, trying oh, to no, grow, and everybody was trying to get better. And then, at the same time, we were taking stuff to try to be different and to make our own mark, too. So if we can grab, like, a little fusion lick from here and put it over the groove or something like that, that's something that this other band wasn't doing. Oh, yeah. You know, so yeah. it was very competitive with other bands, too. So it was a uh, positive thing in that pretty much anything that you brought to the table could be considered if it made you better or different or pushed you in another lane. Yeah. Got you a little bit more shine or a little bit more light. So that is really interesting. Mm-hmm. And I, I do want to pick your brain on, on some theory and stuff like that sure. later. But uh, just to get that mindset of like, that's okay, right? That's right, allowed. Right. Definitely. Instead Definitely. of shutting it down, because people are so afraid. They, they think they're going to lose their audience. They think people are going to want their money back because you did like a jazz lick or something in, in your R&B show. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, man, like be like free to experiment with stuff like that and, and let it be allowed. And I, I think that makes you a better musician. And I, I appreciate you being hard on keyboard players because mm. I'm like that to myself. Right, right. And I think that's the only way to get better keyboard players. Yeah. You know, true. If you're just like, well, that's good enough. And you, you don't want to speak up in that rehearsal because, oh, somebody might get their feelings hurt. Mm. And, and, and I'm sure because I've seen it happen at <laughs> rehearsals with you, where you're not afraid of that stuff. You're like, mm-hmm. no, the music is more important. Yeah. And if you're doing something wrong, you're going to tell somebody. You're going to be the first one to tell them because you got the chart right there. And mm-hmm. you're like, it says right here, flat five, not sharp five. Mm-hmm. Idiot. No. Nah. <laughs> I'm nice about it. No, you really are. You're, you're a professional guy. You, you no, know because I mean? at the end of the day, and you, you said, I mean, the music comes first. And yeah. we're here to serve the music. I was told by a good friend of mine, uh, uh, Mr. Mo Daniels, I have to mention him. Uh, he he once uh, said this to me, and it stuck with me. He was like, you know, when you approach any music, you uh, any performance, dealing with music in any kind of way, you're supposed to feel better at the end than you did at the beginning. Yeah, and that's that stuck with me, and that's what it's all about, you know. So, but so then it is the music, but it's also that you want to say things in a way that is respectful. Because you're a very nice guy. Sure. You're very mm-hmm. easy to work with. You're easy going. You're chill. And mm-hmm. that's important, too. Don't be one of these theory, big brainiac know-it-alls that's like, um, that's not this, but I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to let you figure it out. Mm-hmm. Like, don't be one of these, like, ego tripper guys. And, and you're very good at that. You keep it above board. You keep it professional. So speaking of theory and, and how to hear the differences of stuff like that, taking it back to charts, because this is in essence, what separates guys like you from a lot of, you know, amateurs and and hobbyists is that you take it seriously enough is that you want to know the music well Mm -hmm. and you don't just put in minimal effort. You actually want to know it well. So when you're making a chart, what is that process like? What's the first thing you do when you're like, I got to do this crazy, whatever, Stevie Wonder chart and you, you play the song what are you listening for? Do you start making the chart right away? Like, like, oh, I heard this, and I'm going to put that, and I heard this, and I'm going to put that. Or do you, do you play it through? What, what's the first thing you do? Yeah, as far as my process, I guess the first thing that I do is uh, I find a tonal center. So discern the key, that type of thing. I start from there because once you actually, I mean, that narrows down a whole lot of the possibilities. And then um, from there, I listen to the bass line. I listen to what's happening on the bottom, whether the bass is actually playing the roots or a line that's complementing the changes. Right. You know, uh, versus the roots, the actual roots. Well, let's and, get even more specific real mm-hmm. quick then. When you're trying to figure out what key something's in or, or mm-hmm. the tonal tonal center, like you said, right? Uh, how do you do that? Because you, you throw that out there and musicians are like, okay, well, now I feel dumb because I'm supposed to know what how to do this and... And he just moves on to the next thing, right? So, but but how do you actually find the tonal center? Like, because I I, I teach this stuff, right, to little right, kids. Right. So okay. what I tell yeah. them is that it's it's a couple of different criteria. Mm-hmm. You have to know: is it major? Is it minor? Yeah. Right. Major, minor, diminished. Usually, yeah. the first note, the last note of the song, mm-hmm. is the key, right? The first and and, and the lowest note, right? Mm-hmm. So that's usually how we figure it out. And then we go with key signatures and, and all mm-hmm. that, which opens up a whole other can of theory worms. But just to figure out that first note, what are you listening for? Is it the bass line? 
because we have stuff like parallel yeah. majors, parallel minors, right? So yeah, exactly. How do you really decide? And have you ever been in a situation where you changed your mind and been like, oh, I thought this was in like F sharp minor, but it's actually A major. Is yeah. there really a difference? Yeah. <laughs> so what, what's your opinion that? on that when because you start Because I off? did that with your tune today or the tune that, that, okay. that you want to do later. I, initially, just on my first, just first planet, I'm like, okay, it's in C. I thought right? you would say that. <laughs> it's in C. But then upon listening to it further and then listening to what you did with the E, I was like, okay, it's in A minor. <laughs> so, <laughs> so for folks that are not musicians, for folks that are not musicians, just right. to explain what he just said there. Mm -hmm. So I have a C chord. And yes. so you are technically correct mm -hmm. to call it C. Then the bass line comes in. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. the bass is doing something different. So right. now that C chord kind of changes in relation to the bass. So, But you're hearing stuff like that, and you understand right. that, whereas uh, I wish that a lot of musicians would start being more prepared by learning stuff like this yeah, before the gig, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, But let's keep going. So you said the bass line. What's, what's the next thing? You got your key. It's in whatever, A minor, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So what do, where do we go next? Are we listening for, like, chord changes? Are we listening for the rhythm, the timing? Are, are you counting bars? I'm counting bars and, um, and listening to the colors of, co of the chords, major, minor, diminished. I start there. Um, the tensions in the chord, you know, the extensions on the chord, that type of thing. So... I guess the first thing I probably do is to map out the movement of the roots. Mm -hmm. And then I build the chords from there. Yeah. Right. And at that point, you have a chart. Yeah. Right. It, it, mm -hmm. It's not like a, you know, four and a half hour process. Mm -hmm. If you know the chords, and you know the difference between major, minor, diminished, augmented, etc. Then at that point, it's, it's not that much of a challenge. Right. But the point is, prepare yourself. Yes. you got to at least know a couple of chord qualities if you're not a, a genius mastermind musician you can figure out okay the bass is going bon, all right d d d no that's too high duh no that's too high duh oh there it is on the piano so even for folks who are not super into music theory i think that a lot of musicians will be able to get something out of what you just said in terms of have a process even if it's not perfect and right? then once you get into it it gets easier as you do it more and more. It's one of those things where it just it, it, it grows. It actually gets easier. You'll find yourself writing charts, figuring out chords, figuring out rhythms, figuring out lines faster and easier just from doing it. You know, just from the repetition of actually doing it, developing yeah. those muscles. So well, just like playing your instrument. Right. Yeah, exactly. And and Very would you so. agree that writing charts and understanding theory has made you better at playing yes it's very okay. much so very much so because a lot of guys and say well i'm not into that whole theory thing but what is the benefit of knowing stuff like that i mean you know at its most basic it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it that's perfect so yeah. <laughs> you know that's the most basic but um you know it it, it um when i write out a tune i can actually get a better sense of what's happening with the harmony. And it gives me more ideas of how I can make some alterations and change some colors of that type of thing when I can look at the overall picture instead of dealing with it one chord as, at a time, one phrase at a time, you know, yeah. a measure at a time or four measures at a time. When I'm looking at the whole chart in its totality, I can see certain things happening, and it just gives me more ideas, more of an expansive view. If right. you can look at it in its totality rather than looking at it by piecemeal. Yeah, and, and I think that's kind of a great general thing for musicians out there to, to start challenging themselves to do is to not be so stuck in, you know, beat by beat or bar by bar, but think of music as in longer stretches. Right. Right. And, exactly. and writing a chart will force you to do that because you can say, oh, here's, you know, eight measures or 16 measures, and then that's an A section. All of those measures are now one thing. And then in your brain, instead of having to remember you know, 40 things, now it's like, okay, well, that's one thing that I can remember. And I know what that feels like and about how long it is and about how fast it is, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's a cool thing that you see when you work with young kids and you're teaching them. And over time and over time and over time, you see them uh, playing music, right? And when they start off, they play like this. 
Mary had a little lamb, right? Mm-hmm. So I'd feel everything at, at one thing at a time. Right. And then over time, it's Mary had a little lamb. It's all one gesture. And so that's that's just a mark of knowing your stuff really, really well and being able to com- compartmentalize all that. Um, so that's that's awesome, man. I, yeah. I would challenge One other you. thing, too. Yeah. Um, actually, having it mapped out also makes me a better accompanist. Mm-hmm. Like when I'm playing with a keyboardist or that type of thing. And whereas you may be paying, playing pads, holding the foundation or that type of thing, me playing rhythm guitar, I'm actually breaking up those chords. So I'm actually just playing maybe intervals, fourths, thirds, yeah. sixths, that type of thing. But it makes me better able to color what you're doing if we're working off of the same sheet or harmonically I can see everything that's happening and everything that's laid out. Yeah, because so. I definitely put in a couple of jazz mm-hmm. chords into this song that we're going to do for you guys later. Mm-hmm. And instead of just playing these big, you know, four, five, six note chords, you can get away with doing these little, like, funky kind of sure. little riffs in there, exactly. right? And Double really stops. understanding that chord lets you see, okay, I don't need all six of these notes. And we did a show on this uh, back when I did the um, when I did chord secrets. And harmony secrets where you could have a uh, like a C major nine or something, and you could play that with a G, a C, and a D. It still feels like a C major nine, even though you don't have you know whatever one, two, three, four, five notes in the chord. Um, so You're there's telling some all the guitar secrets. player secrets now because we break up chords all, all <laughs> the time. <laughs> well, give us a little taste of like how you Most would definitely. do that in a uh, situation. Most oh, listen to anything by James Brown. Bass is playing the root. The guitar player very much, may not be playing the root a lot of times. They're just playing the third, yeah. the seven, maybe the five, maybe not. A lot of times we leave the five out because it's such a strong tone that you don't necessarily need. I mean, major, minor, the five is still the same. It's the same note. So mm-hmm. a lot of times you can leave it out and imply it and play other extensions. So we do that a lot. And of Listen course- to Nile Rodgers. Nile yeah, Rodgers no. is the king of the no root chord. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's one of my favorite guitarists ever. Mm-hmm. Like, when I think of a guitar track, especially, like, a rhythm track, mm-hmm. that's the guy that I'm trying to, like, emulate. And one thing Nile Rodgers did, because I listened to a lot of it, and I watched some videos about him, mm-hmm. one thing that he always did was he always cranked the low end on the guitar track to give it, like, a really beefy, um, like, bottom to it, almost like you would do with a bass guitar, but he would crank the, the the low EQ on the guitar on like a rhythm track. Mm-hmm. And on those old disco records, it just made you really feel every little like subtle, like muted pluck of that guitar. And so that's that's kind of the sound that that is my go to sound for, for mm-hmm. guitars when I'm thinking of arranging just because it's so cool. It, it has so much guts to it. And it's not so complex. Like it's not like you're listening to Van Halen or something. You're listening to something with a lot of space in it. It's almost like you mentioned Chuck Brown or listening to like a P-Funk record. Mm-hmm. There's so much space in each track and you can sprinkle it in there. And again, you don't need all every single note of the scale. So if we get into like scales, because in order to really know chords, you got to kind of know scales. Yeah, you got to right? know scales. And earlier you're talking about, oh, we'd stay away from the five and, and this and that. And you're talking about scale degrees. Mm-hmm. So how important is scales? Because scales are so boring to practice, <laughs> right? How did you learn scales? Um, do you have any fun ways to practice ah. scales <laughs> and actually use scales for something useful that's not like doing algebra on your free time? Um, I always wanted to play really nice chords and chords are built from scales. So you got to yep. deal with scales <laughs> in order to get to those nice it's chords. It's like a necessary so, evil. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, and then you hear these chords and you're like, man, how did, you know, what, where did that voicing come from? Or how did they make that chord? And then fingering certain chords, you figure out, or you research and you find out the scales that generated these chords and that type of thing. So you're like, you know, if I get more into these scales, I'll probably get some more chords under my fingers too. So that's kind of yeah. where it kind of went back and forth between the two. Yeah, so. I was watching a um, John Schofield video. Mm-hmm. 
and he was saying something Another about that where where he would take his scales and then he would strategically leave notes out mm-hmm. or move it to a different place on mm-hmm. his fretboard but or play same them all note. on one string yeah, yeah. yeah. and so, so he was talking yeah. about different things you can do to keep your scales from sounding like boring like wonder bread right and I thought that was really cool. Do you have any stuff that you like to do like that when you're soloing to sort of mix it up and, and change it up and not make it just sound like do, re, me the whole time? Um, I, I took in a little chromaticism here and there, you know, a little that's playing half steps, basically. Yeah. To kind of color things up, using approach notes a lot of times, like the note that I'm thinking of that I want to play, I'll approach it from a half step below to kind of give it a little tension and a little flavor some some different little things yeah what, and uh-huh. that's basically turning any scale you have into mm-hmm. like a bebop scale sure right? which sure. is what the jazz guys would do they mm-hmm. everything was half steps mm-hmm. and when you go to like jazz universities or whatever they teach you how to add in exactly the right amount of those sure to equal out to you know a full measure or, or whatever now mm-hmm. i never quite got that academic with it but uh, I, I i i love that idea and I did, when I did the um, chord secrets video, there was a component of that called scale secrets. Yeah. Where I called, uh, I basically took a blues scale, mm-hmm. right? And if you're an amateur musician, you should at least know your blues scale. Yeah. Major and minor pentatonic scale. Yeah, yeah really, essentially, yeah. and with with the blue note in the middle, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so the only thing I did was I turned it into the super blues scale but mm-hmm. by simply taking the upper half of the scale. Mm-hmm. I just making it all half steps. Yeah. So you have kind of a half scale that that keeps you in the That's key of tool. the song, and then you can kind of just go off, you know, off the reservation as you go up uh, the rest of the scale. So I, I always love stuff like that that sort mm-hmm. of exposes the rules, right, and shows you, okay, sure. you can get away with it if you follow a couple of the rules. Yeah. And then you kind of just break it, right? Like Miles yeah. Davis says, uh, learn your theory and then forget it and just play. And just play, yeah. yeah. I do some little tricks like that, too, like mm-hmm. a harmonic displacement thing where I, you know, pentatonics are very simple scales. So what I'll do is I'll play a, maybe a pentatonic scale in the tonal center, and then I'll play the same pentatonic scale up a major second. Oh, yeah. Against the tonal center. Or I'll drop it a half step against the tonal center. So, but the isn't same that... pentatonic scale. So that's kind of, you know, it, you create some tensions and releases mm. within just that simple scale. But doesn't that mean you're playing a wrong note? Mm-hmm. As long as you end on the right note. <laughs> so, right. So, but so many people, so many musicians are mm-hmm. terrified of playing a wrong note, but you don't seem very terrified. No, a- if you play it. a wrong note loud enough, <laughs> I play a wrong note and then I repeat it like I did it on purpose. <laughs> yes, I always joke with people. You always know when a jazz musician yeah. plays a wrong note because they Cause play it four again. more times. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's great, man. You you you're on fire. You you have so much uh, great wisdom and, and great knowledge and great like deep like theory stuff too, which I wasn't really expecting to go that deep into but we really mm-hmm. did we really did and and i'm like dude you know all of that counts as mm-hmm. relevant to me because people of all different experience levels will uh be watching this show mm-hmm. they'll see it the music lovers love to hear musicians talk music you know mm-hmm. <laughs> and the musicians love to learn how to really communicate about that and there's a lot of slang there's a lot of terminology there's a lot of stuff that if you're not in the right cliques, in the right groups, you might be around people who are not as experienced with you, and they might be kind of holding you back. Mm-hmm. Sure. So let's talk about seeking out those people who are higher level, who are more experienced. Do you have any great like mentors or, or influences, parents, siblings, whatever, somebody mm-hmm. that has like taught you something or made an impact on you musically? I have a lot of guys. I mean, I mean, I listen to everything and everyone. And, you know, you, you get a little something here and you get a little something there and you just put it all together. And um, just just keep an open mind and keep your ears open. Just listen. I listen to music for other instruments. You know, I learned oboe solos. Yeah, <laughs> that's a big Because, one. you know, it gives you a, a different approach to melody sometimes, you know. So just be open and listen to everything. 
And what about other musicians in the band, such as like a keyboard player doing something really crazy? Do you ever like yes. stop somebody and be like, yo, what, what was that? That oh, was really cool. All the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Give me one of those. What's something you've learned oh, from a keyboard player? Oh, man. It doesn't need to it, be anything it's, super it's vast. <laughs> but like chord voicing uh, and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, a lot of chord voicings, uh, particularly like um, like we're playing a lot of Stevie Wonder material. And, you know, he's like the king of the dominant seven chord and just altering alterations with just simple triads. Yeah. You know, and um, and that I, I got a lot of that type of stuff from keyboard players slash chords you know right, altering right, right. the roots on the chords so you're taking basically wrong chords and right. putting it on top of the right chord and exactly it kind of a little chords. special yeah. so mm -hmm. um that that's really cool now do you encounter limitations taking something from a keyboard because we got 10 fingers you only really have six strings how do you like figure out what's the best note to go with mm -hmm. you just go with the top ones like i always wondered that for guitar players well, for guitar players, we have a, a little bit of a different uh, edge over you guys in that we can really? play really wide intervals. Right, that's true. What you guys have over us is that you can play really close intervals. Yeah. So for us to voice certain chords, and then you can imply a lot of notes without actually playing them. You touched on that earlier, on guitar, mm. even more so on guitar. Sometimes you can just play a chord and the listener's ear will fill in the rest of the notes. You may only be playing three notes in the actual chord. Really? We're going to get into some of that when we and, play the track. And, and, and are you alluding to like the overtone series it, and stuff like that? Okay. Yes. All right, all right. Very it might so. be a little heavy for this <laughs> first discussion. I might just have to bring you over to just do some theory <laughs> tutorials for folks, man. You got a lot of cool stuff. I mean, I'm learning a lot here. Um, but that's really interesting um, how you can take stuff from one instrument and, and put it on another instrument. Mm -hmm. And you can still make it work and you could still kind of have like that community. And speaking of community, the, the, the last thing I want to get to here, and then don't let me forget to let you plug some stuff, whatever you're working on here, you, mm. uh, you know, sites, social medias, all of that. Uh, but I wanted to ask you in more of a career advice, uh, music business sense. Uh, we performed together in the, uh, Bren Corps all stuff. Yes. And so like, how do you even meet guys that are referred to as all stars, right? <laughs> like, how do you get, how do you be in that right place at that right time and like be able to work with people who are at a higher level? How do you get to the point where, you know, IK Multimedia is calling you to go demonstrate their latest guitar product over here in California and they're, and they're you know, compensating you and asking you to, for endorsement deals and all this. I mean, the mm -hmm. list of endorsement deals is 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 as big as your list of uh, collaborative <laughs> artists. So, give me a little like uh, summary of how do you go from a guy playing guitar in your garage to doing it professionally, but but doing it on a high level profession. Well, what it all boils down to is is where you began the whole segment, just being prepared. Uh, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. But you, you can know? be prepared so. for like a bunch of, you know, 16 year olds in a punk rock band that have no gigs and no fans. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's good. But then how do you make that impression on the people that can actually get you to that next level? And it's really hard to do networking now with everything locked down. Like, yeah, the net networking thing is tough right now. But I was just about to get into that. Just really, just really networking. Like I remember when I first really started to get out and to perform with people i would just go out whenever i could and wherever i could and sit in with folk just to get the buzz going you okay. sit in and then you know you do and people start talking about oh yeah this guy came through that guy came through you know did a good job whatever and as the word of mouth generated your name gets floated around and on top of that you develop a good reputation for yourself being timely knowing the music, being prepared, having your gear in order, um, you know, doing what you say you're going to do is very important. Don't be borrowing and, you know, your friend's guitar at the last minute. And not only being has a jerk. Five strings. <laughs> not being a jerk. Yeah. So it's, it's, you develop your network that way. And so you're at mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, 
the open mic or, or the, the sitting in the, the jazz gig or whatever, what, what happens next? Do you initiate the first conversation? Do, do, do you wait for them to talk to you? Do you start going around handing out business cards? Because I've seen some guys do that. And it's like, that, mm-hmm. that can't possibly be that great of a strategy. I mean, I've seen it work in situations, but like, mm-hmm. hey, what's up? How are you doing? Here's my card. I'm doing this. It's like, oh, come on on a little strong there, bro. Right, right. It's a little bit of all of that. But, you know, it's always good to go off of a recommendation. You know, sometimes you don't want to just want to jump in there cold. You know, come check out, see what's happening, you know. Maybe the first time that you come to a particular spot that you're interested in, you may not get to sit in. You just see how the land lays, you know, do a little bit of mingling, intermingling, see how it goes, and then see observing what's going on and see how you can fit in best and how you can best present yourself and what's going on there. And then uh, once you get your shot, make the best of it. Do your best. So it sounds to me like you're not the guy that goes in there expecting something. Not at all. All at once. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm the great Stan Mm -hmm. Cooper, or I'm the great Owen Adams, (laughs) and do you know who I am? And, oh, nice to meet you, but, you know, I really don't even need to be here right now Mm -hmm. because I'm the great, and you're lucky to even be talking to me. But anyway, I was wondering if I could play here sometime. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah. That might not go too well for you. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like you're just being cool with people and meeting exactly. people and kind of making friends and just just, just being a normal guy. Exactly. And then people yeah. want to do stuff for you. People mm-hmm. want to hook you up because they're like, this guy's cool. He's not trying to take advantage of me. He's not trying to get a, get a bunch of stuff and, and mm-hmm. ride my coattails. Like, He's being so nice, I need to ride his coattails, you know? <laughs> so that's really cool, man. Um, and so we're about to jam here. Um, let's let you plug some stuff, man. Just just go uh. ahead. <laughs> like whatever you want people to buy and, and spend money on and all of that. Okay, well, I have a CD that's coming out very soon. We're trying to get past this COVID thing. Right. Uh, it's entitled Strum Funky, <laughs> which is also... Uh, my uh upcoming website and uh have that coming up i've been working with a lot of other artists as well a lot of people doing a lot of recording just did two uh cds with uh a gospel jazz saxophonist uh originally based in the dc area he's out of texas now phil french so look for his latest two projects uh just did some recording with william beckton another contemporary gospel artist nice and um, just finished up a record with uh, Art Sherrod Jr., smooth jazz saxophonist that's coming out uh, February the 14th, Valentine's Day. That's Sweet. when that's going to drop. Um, another artist, Tracy Cutler, been working on his CD lately. I got to uh, give my man, Alan Johnson, a shout out. Um, Divine Order Recording Studios. So that's been doing up. a little bit of work with him. Uh, with some of his artists it's working out really well so just keep him busy and like what about your social media and stuff because i don't know if it's if it's you that posts it all the time but i do see uh videos with you and mm-hmm. there's 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 one that i found on youtube of you kind of soloing and stuff mm. um where can people find you and follow you and all of that stuff because anybody watching this uh from my friend list is going to love every single thing that you do <laughs> let's so hope so <laughs> where can they keep in touch with you what, do you, what um, platforms are strum you strum funky on all social media platforms one word strum funky that's what's up yeah you heard it here first folks strum funky <laughs> mr stan funky <laughs> stanley cooper aka the candy man that's an inside joke for alan <laughs> okay <laughs> and we didn't even get into all the incredible uh gear that you're playing here mm. maybe if we have some time at the end uh after the folks get to get a chance to hear what it sounds like uh you know may- maybe we'll say what we'll just what is it called first it's an sure. axe effects right 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 that's uh my uh app modeler there and basically uh it digitally models not just the sound of actual two guitar amplifiers and analog as well as digital guitar effects, but also the actual feel. Um, 
it models these instruments down to the component level. So it just doesn't model the sound of, say, a Fender tw twin reverb guitar amplifier. It models right. the actual tubes that are in the amp, the actual resistors that are in the amp. You can actually change resistor values for an amp model in <laughs> oh order to goodness. affect the tone. So it, they model they model this equipment down to the component level, which exactly. makes the sounds really, really authentic. And not only, see, for a guitar player, the tone is one thing, but it has to feel like you're playing an actual amp. And you'll play better the, because of that. Exactly, you know? exactly. And that's really cool, like the, the, the whole amp modeling thing, because it's not just a pedal, right. right? You can go in and like upgrade the amp models and like mm -hmm. tweak it at the software level. So that, that thing has a lot of stuff that I don't even fully comprehend. Yeah, um, you can really, really, you can really get your own character. Mm -hmm. You can really, really get your tone, your sound, your own, your own individual you out of this gear. Dude, that's so. what's up. All I know is it looks really cool. <laughs> it looks awesome. The Enterprise. <laughs> yeah, that, that thing looks like a tank over there, man. It looked like you could like hack into some government buildings with that thing. Um, and then also I wanted you to shout out the app that you're using for all your charts. Oh, the magical yeah. app that like <laughs> magically creates backing tracks and band accompaniments and all that stuff. What People is that tease app me called? About that. I'm the iReal Pro. Uh, iReal Pro Pro. <laughs> Okay. All right. So I use I actually have two apps that I really like. It's uh, iReal Pro, and then uh, also um, uh, Fourscore, which is another really really good app for maintaining your charts, uh, lyric sheets, that type of thing. So between the two, I get the job done. That's awesome. Yeah, you you amazed me earlier. He hit a button on the chart, and then all of a sudden it was a drum. <laughs> track play it and like a piano comp in the chords and stuff and it, was, and it actually sounded like it didn't sound cheap it didn't sound mm -hmm, like a little sure. casio keyboard thing it actually sounded really nice mm -hmm. um so that's cool uh we might be able to see a little bit i don't know if it's in sure. the camera frame exactly but um but anyway uh there we will see all of that in the jam in a second before we do that we're going to take a quick pause here i want to remind everyone to leave some comments if you have any questions for Stan Cooper, if you have any questions for about any of the topics that we mentioned, and don't forget to hit that like button if you're feeling our threads this evening. If you're feeling my like weird like gold flowers or whatever <laughs> this is. Um, <laughs> so good, good. Um, turn on the notifications, subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell if you want to be notified on all our future uploads. See more great legendary uh, guests like Stan Cooper here. <laughs> Squeezing me into his insanely busy schedule, you know he he goes to hang out with with Stevie Wonder and <laughs> and take six, and then he's over here on the On Adams Music show. So with that being said, uh, we're gonna take a quick break, and we'll be back in just a second. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. 